Thank you. Um, again, I'm Jeff. I work at Uber. And over the next 20 to 30 minutes, I'm going to be talking about Ring Pop. Um, and the, the tagline for Ring Pop is uh, scalable fault tolerant application layer sharding. So bringing the sharding into the application rather than uh, in the data store. So over the past four to six months, I would say, there have been a group of us working on Ring Pop. And the reason that we've been working on Ring Pop is to embed it within uh, our new dispatching platform. So I work under the real time engineering team uh, at Uber, which is responsible for managing the fulfillment of a trip. So from the time that you look for a ride to the moment that you request one and get paired up with the driver, and then that driver arrives at your pickup location uh, and finally drops you off. Uh, we're doing a little bit, um, we're doing a few things in the logistics space. If you're familiar with Uber Rush in New York City, it's a bike messenger delivery service. Uh, Uber Eats in Los Angeles is a food delivery service. So we're not just moving people now, we're, we're moving things around. And the dispatching platform that um, is, is using and leveraging Ring Pop is, uh, is built for that, for that purpose. So, and, and where we're headed as an organization is to a more available and scalable infrastructure. And I don't mean like uh, manually scaling and waking up at 3 a.m. and answering calls, but uh, to have these systems be self-healing, um, adding new nodes to the, to the cluster just adds that much more capacity. Um, traffic is evenly distributed over that new capacity. And it's really in an effort to not be um, woken up by pager duty early in the morning. So. Uh, as was previously stated, we are sacrificing some consistency for more availability. And the way that we have achieved that is uh, by working on things like Ring Pop. Uh, so things are a little bit hard to explain. They're abstract. They're, it's a little bit of theory. So I'm going to try to break down the core principles of Ring Pop and then build it back up and tell you about the services that we've built um, with Ring Pop. And tell you how we use it, what features we've built on top of it, and some of the problems that we've had in production. Um, and you may have seen a hint of that, which is called flap damping. So the, the use cases that Ring Pop, Ring Pop can be applied to uh, are many, and we're discovering, we're discovering new ones um, every day. So let's move on to those fundamental or foundational elements of Ring Pop. Um, well, first, it's open source. And for now, it's written in JavaScript because the real-time engineering team is a heavy user of Node.js. There's likely going to be other implementations, probably in Python, probably in Go, uh, maybe even Java. Um, but the, the top three bullet points there are the, those foundational principles or elements of Ring Pop. It is an implementation of a membership protocol. So that allows a, an application, um, let's say an application that serves all the traffic for the pickup requests at Uber um, to know about all of the other members within that application cluster. Uh, it also maintains a consistent hash ring. So once members are found out, once members join um, or leave the cluster, uh, we add that information into the consistent hash ring and hash the s instances addresses along that ring, uh, giving a particular part of the space, the key space over to that instance uh, for the time that it is alive and operating. And then finally, uh, Ring Pop offers forwarding as a convenience. So as your application is receiving traffic, that traffic uh, is probably directed towards a particular entity in your system, like an object with an ID. Uh, that ID belongs and has a home uh, somewhere in your cluster on a particular instance, depending upon how it hashes. And if the key hashes to an instance that is not the one that received the request, then that request is simply forwarded, and all of that is taken care of under the hood, and sort of acts as a middleware layer in the applications that we build, rather than it being very apparent um, and requiring a lot of friction for the developer. So now that we know the, th the top three foundational elements, let's dig a little bit deeper. Uh, Ring Pop as a membership protocol. Well, first, it's it implements a variation of the SWIM gossip protocol. If you're not familiar with what gossip is, it's also called sort of uh, infection style um, dissemination of membership updates, um, little snippets of information about 
The membership lists are disseminated uh, across the many members of uh, the membership list, and the particular implementation of gossip that we use is called SWIM, which was uh, developed by a few Cornell students. Um, and it's also, if you're familiar with the product by HashiCorp call, called SURF, uh, they also implement a variation with a few extensions onto SWIM. So if this were your application and there were three things or three instances of your application, uh, they would have to find out about one another. And the way that they do that is by using the primitives of SWIM, which are ping and a ping rec. And I'll get to what ping rec means a little bit later, but a ping is exactly what it sounds like. It's members kind of heart beating, but doing so in a random fashion. Um, and they choose a random member with every ping, and they eventually get to the full membership list uh, and then rotate that list when they've reached a full round of pinging. So A is pinging B, B is pinging C, C to A, so on and so forth. Um, the pings are used as a mechanism for fault detection and dissemination of information. So let's say you were to have a two node cluster and C came along. Well, A would have been pinging B, B and B to A, but C came around, it joined the cluster. Um, maybe C asked B to join. So B knew about C, um, but A didn't. The next time B pings A, it would disseminate the knowledge that C has become part of the cluster in the next ping. Uh, so that's the dissemination part of the gossip, SWIM gossip protocol. This is all in uh, a white paper that you, is freely available online. Um, it's an easy read, and I think that's one of the benefits of implementing SWIM. It's super easy to understand. It uh, doesn't require a lot of code to be written. Uh, the fault detection part of it is as simple as it sounds. B tries to ping C. C's not there. What happens? Well, what happens is there is some sub-protocol that's then initiated, um, but I'll get into that a little bit later. Another variation, or one of the variations of RingPop's implementation of SWIM is that it actually gossips over TCP, which was not what was stated in SWIM. Um, the reason that we chose TCP wasn't originally deliberate, uh, but it became so because of this forwarding mechanism. So uh, nodes within the ring or within the membership list are now gossiping and forwarding requests over the same channels. So that's one sort of extension or variation of this. Um, if you're observant, you, would, you may have gleaned from what I just said that, that ring pop forms a full mesh, and that may not be the most scalable way of doing things, but we are currently measuring how scalable it actually is, and we're running uh, ring pop as a standalone service now and going to find out how well it could scale. Maybe it'll scale up to 5,000 nodes, 10,000, however many we find out. Um, and maybe we'll have to change the underlying uh, transport, but maybe not. Um, another extension to SWIM is that we compute membership and ring checksum. So again, it's ring pop is a membership list and a ring. And the way that the two differ is that the membership list contains the instance addresses as well as their statuses, whether they're alive, whether they're suspect, whether they're faulty, and also ad some additional metadata like the incarnation number, which is a logical clock. So all of that information is combined and we compute a checksum from it. The ring checksum differs because uh, the ring only contains the server addresses, so we checksum that too. And the way that these checksums are used is that in the event that a request is forwarded or uh, a ping happens and the source and destination che checksums differ, we know that there's some weird divergence in the cluster, and we have to rectify that, that divergence somehow. And finally, um, just a, a small nuance is that SWIM actually goes about defining um, how membership status is to be kept by uh, saying that down members should be removed from the list. We actually keep down members in the list, uh, and that's used for um, ways to merge a split brain after there's a network partition. So let's say two clusters form from your application. If we didn't know about the previously faulty or down nodes because the network partition happened, then there's n there would be no way to merge them back together. Um, OK, so in summary, Membership protocol allows nodes to discover one another and eventually leading to a consistent view of the world, but not strictly consistent or strongly consistent. So members with the membership protocol are able to discover one another. Uh, the consistent hashing port or the consistent hash ring part of this, um, some of the nuances or details of that is that RingPop uses farm hash as its hashing function. Uh, 
farm hash is derived from city hash, uh, which is a library or algorithm um, divided, uh, developed by Google. And the, there's an interesting story about how we came to use farm hash, and that is originally we were using um, a library developed by Voxer, which uses hardware accelerated CRC32 instruction, and farm hash. Uh, the hashing function wound up actually being faster than the hardware accelerated um, than the software one. Uh, reasons that escape me now. <laughs> uh, ring pop uses, uh, implements its underlying data structure for its ring is a red black tree providing login, lookups, uh, inserts, and removals. And then to spread uh, the nodes around the ring to give a, li give a little bit even more even distribution. Um, adds replica points for every node within the ring uh, and adds a uniform number of them. So the, the nodes and the hosts that are running these nodes are treated as homogenous, but you can imagine a world where maybe you wouldn't want that. But for now, they're, it's completely uniform. And the forwarding part, so we have codified uh, this handler forward pattern. Uh, if key arriving at Instance A hashes to me, I can process it, otherwise I need to forward it. Ring pop forwards this information over T-channel, which is a networking uh, framing protocol that we've developed in-house that is used for just general RPC. Um, it supports out-of-order responses and is extremely high performance benchmarks ranging from like 20,000 to 40,000 um, sort of operations per second. And uh, forwarding is transparent, like I said earlier in the talk. It acts as uh, a, middle a middleware layer for applications. So before it even gets to your business logic, the request is already routed to the appropriate node. And for now, because many of our underlying, many of our services are um, HTTP services, we sort of pack HTTP in the, in the message that's transmitted over T-channel when it's forwarded and then reconstructed on the other side. But uh, we're moving over to a more thrift um, world and eventually HTTP and an HTTP request and response sort of model will be, will be old news. OK, so now that you know those foundational elements, let's get into how ring pop actually works. So let's say you have one instance of your application. It doesn't need to scale. Uh, you're getting a few requests per second, um, and you have one node. Uh, but maybe you've already embedded ring pop within it. So what ring pop is going to do when A starts up is um, it's going to check a bootstrap list. So what we have on our file system is a, um, a JSON array in a text file, which is read on startup. And it could be relatively up to date. But ring pop is going to choose a random set of members to join from, from, that member uh, from, the, from the list. We're not using multicast yet. Um, but if your infra infrastructure supports it, it might be even easier to do and a little bit more robust. Um, so the first node starting up has no one to join. There's nobody else running. Moving over to the second frame, B starts up, and now it has A to join. It's going to go through the same process, read the file from disk, um, select a random number of members, and this time it'll find A, and then they'll form, start to form this consistent hash ring in the background running within memory. Um, in ring pop. So they're positioned along the ring, and now they start to exchange info with one another, and they form a two-node cluster, um, and they're pinging each other back and forth. So the way that forwarding requests work, uh, let's say C came along, and now all of the addresses and replica points are evenly distributed around the ring, and A, B, and C are pinging one another. Um, what happens if a request arrives for entity with the ID 123? So we, we employ this handler forward pattern. And what that looks like in code is ring pop .lookup, or give it the, the sharding key. Um, you get a destination back. If the destination resolves to A, well, then A can handle the request. Otherwise, it, forward it forwards it over that T-channel transport to its destination. And the way that faults are detected in ring pop um, is pretty simple. It uses the ping mechanism as defined by SWIM. So B pings C, and B finds that C is no longer responding to pings. So what C is going to do is it's going to transition uh, from the alive state, which is where it's, how it starts, uh, and B is going to say, OK, that ping failed. 
So let me, as defined by swim, um, select k random members to do an indirect ping to see if they can reach C. If they also fail to reach C, then B is going to start a suspect period, which is an arbitrary amount of time. You can tune it. Um, in that time, B will then disseminate that information about C becoming suspect. So the next time B pings A, B will say, oh, I've actually found that C is, is, is unstable or not responding, so it's a suspect. And A will then start its su suspect period for, B, uh, for C as well. Eventually, if that suspect period times out, um, C is considered faulty and actually removed from the ring. So that's that third frame there. Uh, any lookups that you do in the consistent hash ring will no longer hash to C, and it'll just hash to A or B. So that's sort of the rebalancing effect of the consistent hash ring. You only lose sort of 1 over, one over N, or only 1 over N is rebalanced. Um, so what else did I want to say about this? Oh, right. So the reason that this suspect period exists is because uh, we're sacrificing a little bit of fault detection time for, um, for fewer false positives. <laughs> uh, so you wouldn't want B to ping C and there be some intermittent network blip and uh, immediately deem C out of the ring and like, you know, rebalance everything that needed to be rebalanced. Um, you would want to wait and give it C some time to reassert that it is alive. And that's what it is able to do in that suspect period. So that's a trade-off that you have to make. Um, do you want faster convergence or do you want fewer, uh, fewer false positives? And you could tune certain parameters within ring pop um, to take care of all that. OK, so we've been through how forwarding works, membership works, dissemination of that information, faults are detected. So at Uber, what have we done with RingPop? Well, we've built a few services out of it, um, a stateful HTTP long pole service. So when that HTTP long pole connection arrives at some instance within your cluster, we need to find it a home. Um, it actually finds a random home. We don't use RingPop to, to establish where the connection is made. Um, but we do use RingPop to associate that connection with any pending messages that have not yet be been delivered from server to client. Similarly, in the same vein, there's a, a sync service that we have that s replicates or emulates the state of what's on the client mobile phones um, back on the server side and represents that as an object model, as a graph. Uh, and we use and shard by user ID in that sync service. We use RingPop uh, as a way of rate limiting. So the sharding key that you could use is maybe a user ID or an IP address. Um, we've built out a geospatial service, which retains all of the driver locations in memory for fast lookups. Um, so if we want to dispatch uh, your pickup request to the nearest drivers, we are able to um, use the geospatial service for that. And the sharding key that we use for that is uh, an S2 cell ID, so Google's S2 library. Um, so we get a, a, we get a covering, um, an S2 cell covering for the, the radius that we want to uh, select cars from. And based on that covering, we find out what the cell uh, IDs are, and then forward or read or write request to the instances within the cluster that have the data for those drivers. Uh, overlay routing services, so if uh, service A needs to connect to service B, and uh, the routing fabric has an affinity to, to some of those uh, B services. We use RingPop for that. And in general, if you need data closer to you than your data store allows, uh, then, and you just need general in-memory caching, but don't want to store the whole world in the address space, then you could use RingPop for that as well. So these are some services that we've built out. Um, and as I said, the use cases that we're discovering, which apply to RingPop, um, come about pretty, pretty frequently. What, what do you do for service discovery of the actual clients? Do you, do you bootstrap them through a load balancer and they, they get an optimal path, or do they have a cache reset on service discovery? Or? Uh, say that again? On the clients of the services? Clients of the services, yeah. Is it just service discovery to, through a known load balancer for first connect? Yeah, or how do yeah. You do the, Well, yeah, so what happens is um, the clients, uh, well, 
Yeah, the clients know how to find one of the service routers based on a, a bootstrap list. And then from there, the, the routing layer just knows how to find um, uh, which nodes have affinity towards the ser to the service that you're getting towards by uh, using ring pop to shard by the service name. Yeah, yeah. It just there's a known a known uh, number of router nodes, and it knows how to load balance across those nodes. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so, um, how to extend or the features that we've built on RingPop? Now that some of these services are are using it, um, there there are some more requirements that have come about, and the way that we've extended RingPop and the features that we've added to. Uh, it are an actor model like system. Um, so messages arrive and they're arriving concurrently, and uh, we want those to be processed one by one. Um, we put those messages that arrive based on the sharding key uh, in a mailbox and um, then process them by one, one by one. The geospatial service had a few different requirements. All of the state is ephemeral or volatile, so um, and we rely on driver update, uh, location updates to repopulate that data. But in the event that one of those services crash, we need some way of continuing to do good dispatches to find uh, the nearest drivers. So uh, replication has been added to RingPop as well, sort of the way uh, that REAC offers it. You specify like an N and R and W value, and it writes to that many nodes and um, only requires um, the reads to uh, be successful on however many you specify in that R value. Um, and then we also have extended RingPop by, uh, well, a service has required reliable background operations to be possible. So let's say the way that Uber works is um, you request UberX on your phone, and then we choose the nearest drivers to that pickup location that you've specified, and then we send out a dispatch to that driver. So in the background, we only give the, the driver however many seconds to respond to that dispatch. Uh, or, and otherwise, if they don't respond, we send that call out to another driver. So how do you make that reliable in the sense that if that process that started that background timer to do that dispatch expiration crashes, how do you make sure that it's carried out on another node? So we've built an extension on top of RingPop to do that as well. Um, so the actor-like model, actor-like mo system, uh, the way that it works is pretty self-explanatory or um, pretty obvious. Three different requests, or however many concurrent requests, arrive at A. A decides whether one, two, three lives on it or elsewhere. Um, those requests are queued up serially and uh, processed one by one. The each request that's processed one by one may result in some other request to another service or more actors to be spun up. So the actors on our system are either drivers or maybe even the trips that those drivers uh, are on. Can you explain that third diagram a bit more? Like, oh, what are the yeah, I was, just, I was just kind of depicting um, each of the requests to be processed one by one. And uh, the, what we use REAC as our backing data store for some of our services. Um, to store the entities in our system, drivers, ongoing trips. Um, and I was just using this as a X as a way of representing that a new actor was created, new driver comes online, or a new trip is created. And because that actor has come about, we then need to um, treat it as a first class citizen so that it has a mailbox and it, any requests for it are being processed in a serial fashion. And persistence of actors are stored. Yeah, yeah. So the entities that live in our system have an ID, and uh, the, those actors and all of their metadata is stored in REAC. Um, so what you would find as part of the business logic for these applications is a typical, like, get your data from REAC, you know, update it, and then, and then store it back. Um, so replication, the way that it works, this is a naive example. Um, because you'll notice in the second frame, uh, there's something interesting that could happen. But let's say a post were to come into 123 arriving at A. Uh, what you do with 123, uh, by convention, you append a 0, 1, or 2 um, to, to, as a convention to represent the replicas. 
and you get R1, R2, and R3 back. And then you um, send that same post request to the replicas that those keys hash to. The problem with this is uh, R1, R2, and R3 may all be the same host. Um, because by convention, you may get lucky, and all of them might hash to a, a three different hosts. Or they may hash to the same host, and you really don't have replication. Um, this is actually something that's specified in the Dynamo paper. Like, they, they point this problem out explicitly and say that you need to walk the ring in order to find your unique. Um, so you, f you hash your key to some spot in the ring, and then you walk it clockwise direction to find unique replicas adding up to whatever your W value is. And then the reliable background operations. Again, a request uh, arrives at A for entity 1, 2, 3. As a result, A starts this background timer. So maybe it stores some metadata about uh, 1, 2, 3 in React, and then starts the background timer because a new trip is born, and we need to dispatch that trip to a driver. So uh, in the background, this timer is ticking and ticking and ticking. And then, oh no, A fails. So, so how do we resume the timer? Well, um, V nodes act as like an additional abs key abstraction on top of the keys itself. And the V node key space is uh, much shorter or much smaller than the key space of like 2 to the 160, right? Like, so you choose a number of V nodes, maybe 96 or 1,024. And when A goes down, um, and this is a fixed thing, so the number of V nodes doesn't change in your system. When A goes down, B will detect uh, a ring state change. A has been removed. So what B needs to do is uh, it needs to find out it, if it needs to take ownership of any keys that A previously owned. So what we do in this step is say, request for 1, 2, 3 arrives at A. A stores a V node to key mapping in Rioc. So um, key modulo uh, number of V nodes, we get the V node for that key back, we stick that in Rioc, in a Rioc set. Then when something fails, we need to reload that set and the V node key mappings uh, for all the timers that we're running. So we iterate over all of the V nodes, 0 through 1023. And we say, um, B look up V node. If the V node hashes to B, then we load from Rioc um, the set for, of all the keys for that V node. And with those keys, we then could perform entity lookups in the same Rioc data store to see what state those entities are in and see if their status is still in a state of being, uh, currently being dispatched. And if they are, then we could restart the timers. So rather than iterating over the entire like, integer key space, and trying to see which node, which keys hash to um, which portion of the ring, we sort of uh, created an additional layer above that uh, where there's a fixed number of V nodes, and we could do it uh, easily. So um, the flap damping part. So this all works fine and dandy when the ring is in the cluster is in operating in steady state. But what happens when uh, things go wrong? Uh, you could see a lot of, when things go wrong and, and um, nodes are removed from the hash ring, you're going to get a lot of flaky lookups. So key 1, 2, 3 hashes to A. Oh no, it hashes to B and to A. And that's what this problem tries to solve. So how has RingPop dealt with bad nodes? Um, if A pings B and B responds, everything is great. The next round of the protocol, um, A pings B again it's down. Next time, third time, it's up again. If there's a bad actor, if there's a slow node, it's overwhelmed by traffic, it's going to act erratically. So what we want to do with this erratic node is evict it from the cluster as fast as possible. So this, this transition of becoming alive to suspect, back to alive, or alive to faulty, and then back to alive are known as flaps. Uh, and we detect flaps by storing the membership updates that are disseminated as part of the swim gossip protocol. Um, so when we detect a flap, which is actually harder than it may sound, um, we penalize the bad actor. So and every node stores a uh, penalty for every other node in the cluster. So its view, A's view of B is different than C's view of B. Um, when the penalty exceeds 
a certain suppression limit, then that node is damped. That damped status is, uh, is disseminated throughout the cluster and uh, removed from the ring, evicted, and is penalized such that it can't join the ring uh, for however long you specify. There's actually a holding period after that um, damped period because what happens is when you damp a node, it's evicted from the ring and you don't know how it's been acting uh, since being evicted. Uh, so when it comes back alive, you don't know if that was because it's intermittently and still flapping or uh, it's actually the problem has been fixed and you've like fixed whatever configuration puppet prob problem that was causing this thing to act poorly. So the way that this works in uh, diagram form is as I previously stated, ping one fails, ping two is okay, ping three fails. Um, that's my little uh, Google Slides art there. Um, <laughs> this is really, really great. Looks like a kid drew it. Um, so what I'm trying to depict here is B's, the, the damp score for uh, B at site A is increasing. And then there's an exponential decay for, uh, that, that we apply um, to reward it for good behavior. So if damp score goes up and then decays, 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 it, the problem was fixed, it's not going to be penalized and it's not going to be evicted from the ring. But if we detect flap and then flap and then flap and it exceeds that red line, what we're going to do is enact a damping sub-protocol, which is very similar to this indi indirect <coughs> pinging sub-protocol that I talked about that SWIM defines. So what we do at A, when the damp score for B exceeds that red line, is we reach out and fan that out, fan a damp, fans out, fans out a damp rec request to K random members and asks for their damp score of B. If they say, yeah, B is also, to, to me, B is acting weird, um, then finally B, and if B is flapping too much, B is damped, um, A marks B damped and then disseminates that information along the gossip protocol and hopefully the, the cluster survives this storm that, that ensued after B's erratic behavior. So fun and interesting production problems that we've seen. Um, there are all sorts of nuances uh, of gossiping. Um, there are all sorts of ways to improve convergence times. You'd be surprised what you actually find in production and different ways that things can fail. Um, but that's, that's all. That was my last slide. If you're inspired by any of the stuff, any of the material in this talk, um, I have some takeaways for you. If you've not read the Dynamo paper yet, um, do so. It's interesting. If you've not read all the REAC documentation, that, was, uh, that is an inspiration to all of these ways of handling distributed system problems, uh, do so. Um, the flap damping technique was inspired by BGP's route flap damping. So network routers have a way of uh, sussing out bad routes. So read that paper. It's actually called BGP flap damping algorithms. And uh, I previously said that detecting flaps is hard. Uh, and they've noticed that. Um, and they have different ways of detecting flaps and which, which routes are flappy and which aren't. It's a good, interesting read. It's, it's many pages, so be careful. Um, consistent hashing, there's a paper, there's all sorts of material out there. There's that lovely diagram up there with the colors that, that is very easy to understand. Farm hash, uh, ring pop on GitHub, feel free to go to it, go to it on, uh, go to GitHub, T channels, GitHub page as well. And then the gossip, uh, swim gossip protocol, um, a really interesting read, go to the surf page, um, read about how it's modified swim, um, lots of really fun material to learn and to read up about. Um, and that's all I got. And of course, Uber is hiring. So if, <laughs> if you're so interested, so inclined uh, to work on this kind of stuff, feel free to email me at that email address. Um, but that's all I have. And I'll take questions if you have them. Yes? What language is uh, ring up written? JavaScript. JavaScript. Yeah. Um, that's just because we're, we're a heavy Node.js team. Um, and Eventually, we want ring pop or ring pop like things to be embedded in most services that run, so likely going to be written in other languages. Um, we have, a, what is it called? Polyglot. We're a polyglot company, so um, Go is really seeing an uptick now, so maybe there'll be a ring pop Go version. Yeah? How 
do you compare and contrast Ringpop versus something like Microsoft's or Layton's papers or uh, React's core implementation? React's quorum implementation? React core. Oh, React Core. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, no, but, but in all honesty, like, I, I didn't know about React Core. Or Orleans? Uh, no. Okay. It's all escaping me. Uh, well, not escaping me. I just <laughs> don't know about it. But, but I recently discovered, was like, Surf has this external module called member list or whatever. Um, and it's like, oh, that actually does all the things that, like, RingPop is doing in JavaScript. So, um, or, and with a few variations. They, they seem to have more production experience with it because they've started long ago. Um, but yeah, it's kind of in the sim same vein. Uh, do you know like, the, what React Core is all about and like, the initiatives behind it? Is it meant to be this like, generally reusable agent that could run? That, like yeah. You could actually put all of your services behind React Core. Yeah. In fun with JavaScript into it if you wanted. Yeah, it's an option. We were actually. The, the way that ring pop came about is like we know that we needed like this sort of ordering mechanism and mailbox mechanism and then we found like other services needing to park their long pole sessions and I started to play with this thing called surf and like seeing how it would function with a uh, JavaScript application that's running in tandem with the surf agent and how to like synchronize the two and then uh, our chief systems architect was just like <coughs> Let's just, let's just see what we could do and have it embedded because we'll, we'll gain a lot by having it embedded in, in a language that we're comfortable with. So React Core is an option. This member list thing is an option. We may use it. We may find that it's extremely beneficial to use. So totally open. And I had another question. In addition, um, I noticed that your system seems to be an AP system. How can you choose an AP system versus a CP system? Um, because we need to allow trips to happen at all costs. And we're willing to sacrifice a little bit of inconsistency for um, dispatching availability at all times. If there are times that we cannot like, acquire a lock or something like that because a system is unavailable, um, that's why we've moved over from like, Redis as our backing data store for real-time data over to React. Like, uh, we, really, we very much want to kill, um, be able to kill a master. Uh, and that's hard to do when like, there's a master. <laughs> and if <laughs> and and if there is no master, that's even better. Um, so we we're employing like this chaos monkey Netflix type style of like killing all things and being able to recover without us being paid by pager duty. So yes, so you work for Uber. I do. Uh, so why? Leading question. Leading question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so why? If I remember correctly, Surf uses UDP for the gossip. Yeah. Why TCP for that? Honestly, uh, <laughs> like I said, the, the decision wasn't deliberate originally. Uh, I actually implemented Ring Pop um, over HTTP um, first, and like we got that going. And then Matt, who you know, yep. was like, "Well, I've been wanting to build this like uh, fault tolerant RPC layer," um, and he he wrote T Channel, and we just migrated over from. Um, HTTP, which you know had had its own sort of limitations, uh, over to T channel. And that was that was the story. So not really like a a deliberate decision and weighing the the trade offs, but it ev it evolved into that. You can feel free to answer this one offline if you want. Yeah. What would be the differences between like T channel and like thread for protocol buffers? Like uh, you, kind of, you kind of toss this thing out, but you don't really describe what it is. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you could read more about that in the documentation section of T-Channel. I might not do that justice. So, so you mentioned uh, the bootstrap and a shared file system kind of bootstrap yeah. scenario. Uh, any consideration of using some sort of discovery service like console or etcd to do that instead, even if you only keep a partial list? Um, yeah, so we're taking, we're taking service discovery to a, a total different direction. So. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> we're, we're doing our own thing. We're here. Hello. Uh, hey, at which uh, scale did you guys realize you needed something like Ring Pop, and what scale do you guys have now? Uh, I probably won't be able to answer that. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, How about orders of magnitude? 
Um, so we are, uh, we are building an architecture for scaling up to like 100x, 100 times what we see now. And that may come uh, very soon. It's like sh shorter than a few years. Yes? So you mentioned that you're using TCP for pings. Um, yeah. That's right. Um, <laughs> yep. <laughs> and you're going to scale 100x? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why, that's why we have a standalone ring pop running to see what those limitations are. Yeah. Related to this question of um, scale, is, is 5,000 kind of what you've gone up to today? Um, we have about. The largest cluster that we have now is uh, within a given application is about 720 members, something like that. And a question on, on kind of this slide. When, when, you, when you've got a, a service developer and you tell them you're going to have to scale your service, you're, you know, our architecture is now ring pop, the way to teach app developers or service developers to rethink how they write it, is it like go read this philosophy and then come talk to us about how much of your time are you spending teaching the philosophy of yeah, protocol sharding to people who have already built services and um, kind of have to, I mean, it's kind of a big rewrite for most of them, I understand. But yeah, so we're, we're not, we haven't yet, we've introduced this into new services that we've written, but we've not gone ahead and like embedded it into old services. Um, so the process has been because the team that has developed uh, Ring Pop has also developed those services. We were very like okay. much working with them closely, um, but now the information is starting to be spread out across the entire engineering group, and we're doing a bit of like evang uh, evangelism. Yeah. Yes. So I came in a little late, so I'm sorry if I missed this. But uh, uh, is is protocol tolerant to Netflix to um, yeah. Like, uh, tolerance, tolerant, yes. Um, it will. F there will be two. W on whichever side of the partition, there will be two clusters that are formed, and we have a way of um, merging the clusters, but uh, no more tolerant than that. Yeah. But you, you said that the maintaining the down list made it less painful than it would be if you just had two clusters that had never heard of each other. Exactly, yeah. Because you can imagine, like, you know, 120 nodes, 60 on one half, 60 on the other, 60 get removed from one, 60 get removed from the other. There are two independent clusters that form partition at the network layer, you know, uh, form uh, heals. And then what do those 60 do? They're like, well, I don't know about those 60. That that were previously removed, so um, we keep those ar them around. So uh, we we attempt to, or we will attempt to heal that by um, starting a another like sub protocol, if you will, to ping those faulty members every now and again to see if they've come back to life. Yeah. Have you run clusters between different data centers? Or no, not yet. Yep, but we we will. Yep. So given the, the maintained down list, how is being uh, faulty or suspect different from being in the damp list? What, like, it, it, it seemed from what you're describing of the damp list, like it was basically just an, another, another word for down. It is another word for down, but um, the way that they're treated differently is um, a damped member will, may attempt to join or may attempt to reassert that it is alive. Um, at the time that, let's say, if B were damped uh, and node A is just running there by itself, um, B comes back to life, A sees that it's damped, it's going to apply the, it's going to evaluate the damp score and the damp decay to see if it's decayed enough below the like reuse threshold or reuse limit. Um, so, th and that doesn't happen for faulty members. So there's a, a bit of, 
logic that goes on for any pings that arrive for damped members. So basically, it's just extra faulty, and if it tries to join again, it might get told. It's no, it's whereas, extra faulty, whereas yeah. It, whereas faulty is just yeah, oh, sure. Welcome back. Yeah, yeah. That's a good that's a good way of describing it. We've we've considered it as like simply like a different thing altogether. Damped is different than faulty, but maybe we could have done packed some of that logic into the faulty faulty member code or whatever. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, we're moving more towards a container world, but bare metal for now. And when you say polyglot, is it more lang uh, programming polyglot, or is it the persistent also polyglot? Uh, yeah, we're, we're polyglot all the way down, I would say. Yeah. Don't make, yeah. Don't make questions hurt. No, no. Uh, there's some people who say like just and it's kind of not easily defended, but you shouldn't shard above like the the concept of your data model. Yeah. And this is kind of doing that, but you've got kind of a pseudo data model because you've got real world concepts that probably shard well in terms of how you can handle your 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 application concepts coming in, like driver IDs and stuff like that. Yeah. Do you end up with any like philosophical debates in terms of scaling <laughs> and internally and whether or not you should be Sharding that entry layer. Um, what? Is, it, is, it, is it all just in memory? And it's all in memory, yeah. No philosoph philosophical debates yet. Yeah, um, yeah but I, I mean, I'd like to hear the debates now, if you got them. <laughs> I, I would love to learn about like you know why why we shouldn't be doing this because I'll just like delete the repo from GitHub and just. <laughs> 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 you. That's a good question. Uh, so uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the things that we <laughs> left out of the SWIM paper, um, SWIM kind of, um, one of the things it achieves is a constant sized message payload, because it tries to pack it all in one UDP packet. Uh, our packets are extremely large. Um, there is a decay factor on the dissemination that goes on. So like, you know, B becomes faulty. We disseminate that for a period of time and uh, probabilistically, the node should have converged by the time that uh, the update no longer uh, is disseminated. Um, but right now, we are transmitting JSON across the cluster, super inefficient. Um, we're trying to pack that down into thrift. And uh, so unbounded for now. So they're usually bigger than their MTUs. Probably. Yeah. yeah. Is it working? Like you, you initially, <laughs> and I don't mean that in any sort of leading way. Like you, you initially said you had a problem where you're getting pages in the middle of the night, yeah, and you're attempting to solve that. It's so a good question. Of an update, is, is it working? Um, I mean, it's working. Yes. So, like, <laughs> as I talk, you were hoping it would do. as I teeth, well, I, as I, I as I talk, <laughs> the the CPUs are spinning. Um, how to answer that question? Um, yeah, so I think it works because the old infrastructure or the old, the way the old services are written is that um, they have very fixed um, partitioning. And the problem there is that um, once you get assigned, you are assigned there forever so long as you are active on Uber system. Um, If that host goes down, we need to manually change that assignment um, by like running a script that we wrote um, to reassign everybody that was assigned to one place to another place. Uh, what we get for free with ring pop and like the consistent hashing and rebalancing is that if a node dies, um, we don't have to be woken up unless like the user experience has deteriorate, deteriorated. But if the system is just processing requests and everything rebalances just fine um, and evenly, then there's nothing more to do. So in that way, I think we've, we've won. There's probably some other wins that, that I could talk about. No, but yeah. So I take it your app stack holds a fair amount of state that cannot be really coordinated between nodes. You don't have a centralized database. 
Texas or something where it wouldn't really matter where you're learning? Um, I mean, if applications need to use RingPop they, or, or want to, they can. But if you don't require any of the things that I talked about, then you don't have to use it. But um, we do have centralized real-time data stores. And we store all of the like, driver information that for drivers that are on our system or uh, trips that are ongoing and the various states that they could be in that are operating on this, in this state machine uh, within, within React. Uh, some partially React, partially Redis. Yeah, so pretty pretty traditional way of like interacting, an app, pretty traditional way of building an application, just with this sort of like middleware component in there. What's up? With all the nodes that you have in your ring pop, um, how do you do logging to see who did what, where it went wrong? Uh, yeah, that's a good that's a good question. Um, well, we log to Kafka from each one of these nodes, but it's really it's really hard to um, find out how long the convergence times are, I've noticed. Um, so what I've done is like provided within RingPop itself like a roll-up of membership updates that have recently been seen. And if updates aren't seen within a given portion of time, well then all the updates that were received prior to then will be emitted and uh, like, you know, put into uh, Elasticsearch and we could see for every node in the system which updates they received and how long it took from the first update that was received to the last update. And manually like seeing, okay, how long do joins take? How long does um, a partial failure take? How long does 50% of the cluster going down take to converge? I would like to eventually get to a point where there's a monitoring system that knows how to query the state of, um, of the running instances to find out like, what their ring checksums and membership checksums are and be able to report in real time um, and for us to be able to look at a dashboard and say, OK, that's the state of every application that has a ring pop embedded within it. Hello. Uh, can you mention about the ping frequencies? Uh, ping frequencies. Right now, they are 200 milliseconds. So five every second. Um, we s that is also sort of um, the, the ping response time is also added to the ping frequency. Um, we have not, we could, we could up it, we could, we could decrease it, but 200 milliseconds uh, for now. And that's 200 milliseconds between each one or 200 milliseconds for the whole cycle? For, for each one, yep. So multiply 200 by however many nodes in your cluster and that's how long it takes to make a full round. So yeah. Yeah. Um, possibly, <laughs> depending upon how much traffic so we're receiving. Yes, I had a follow-up question. Yeah. Would you be still going with the gossip protocol, and would be would it be a different? I mean, the architecture, all the everything looks great, but in terms of uh, protocol, yeah. Uh, because you'll be handling these requests rather than the real requests, so would you be going with a different protocol? Going with a different maybe. I I mean, it's an it's an option, but so far we've not found the need found the need to. Um, we're, we're monitoring everything closely. Um, yeah, like P99 response times for pings are under, under a millisecond. So, um, so far, so good. Same uh, you're, yeah, you're running out of cards. <laughs> In terms of the app code inside, like as, as, you, as you roll code, did you say it was right black for how you actually, like if, if someone's got a service and they want to do a release, like a canary release of new code for, for their nodes. How yeah. does that behave? Like, how do you match ring pop to your release strategy for, for app code? Um, does my question make sense? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, Re rephrase. We have all the time yeah, in the world. So, so we've got, you've got all the stuff. It's, it's acting on ephemeral data for drivers or something. You want to change the API, right? Yeah. Something. How do you roll that? Code does, does Ring Pop know that that uh, yeah. nodes are running different code levels of the service? Like, no. Or does it care? Or it doesn't. It doesn't care. Actually, uh, so I could talk about two things. One is uh, deploys and restart times should be lower than the suspect period that I talked about. Mm -hmm. So suspect period trades off like fault detection for um, or no, yeah, 
longer fault detection times for um, fewer false you positives. Mark them damped or something, you just no, so that's the thing. The, a deploy should not like disrupt the cluster at all. Nodes may go from alive to suspect because the pings fail as they're restarting, yeah. um, but they should not go faulty. If they do, that means that lookups. Um, the deployment failed. Also. Well, it it mean yeah it means that or it just means that the stop and start time of that instance after having been deployed um, took longer than the suspect period, and like a deploy should not do that to you, to the to the cluster. Yeah. But we like we don't want to get to a world where. We're afraid of deploying because, like, you're going to disrupt the ring. Like, yeah. deploy should be super fast, and convergence time should be sensitive enough, but not s too sensitive. Um, the other thing that I've noticed is um, so, like, ring pop is still new. Uh, major version updates of ring pop and breaking changes. Like, how the fuck to do that? Um, I'm still working on that. <laughs> like. Uh, so, so if you go to T-Channel, there's like really good documentation. There's a whole team of engineers working on it. You'll see a, a lot of commits. Um, a new version of the protocol is coming. You know, just so happened to a new, a new RPC protocol. There's version one, and of course, now there's version two. So how do we like roll that, roll ring pop, the underlying transport for ring pop version two, which is a breaking change, out in, in a way that's graceful? So do you like double the capacity? Uh, and deploy your, your new code with v2 as a separate cluster and then switch over the clients? Or do you somehow like add versioning into the join process by like saying, well, version 10 of Ring Pop is trying to join version 9. Uh, just don't allow that. But when we're talking like transport and network connections and protocols, like that, that gets a little bit crazy. So. Um, I'll uh, let you know in a few months. <laughs> <laughs> Next meetup. Yeah. As a comment on that, um, I highly recommend looking at the Orleans paper. They or Orleans, like New Orleans? Like, just yeah. Orleans. Yeah. Okay. Like Orleans. Right, 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 of course. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So <laughs> just trying to get the spelling so in my head. The Orleans paper, the original paper, talks about outsourcing the uh, persistence to a secondary system. Okay. Um, and how to deal with transitions of running multiple instances of Orleans and then utilizing the secondary system to transition between versions. Um, I would love to read that. Yeah, Thank you for so, uh, mentioning it. Um, and then Katie was supposed to be here. I don't see her. But yeah, she actually worked on the system. Cool. Um, so post the meetup and I'm sure she can talk to you. Sweet. Thanks. What's next door? What's next door? Twitter. Oh, I've heard of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they do a lot of what? <laughs> I think we'll, we'll call it a question. Yeah, thank you. Really good questions. I knew there would be some yeah. attending this meeting. So awesome. Great job, Jeff.